You're listening to an Axe Church sermon. Axe Church Northwest is located in Vancouver, Washington, and we have services meeting each week at 9 a.m. and 11 a.m. You can also join us online live at our 11 a.m. service each Sunday. If you'd like to know more about Axe Church Northwest, you can go to axechurchnw.org. Now enjoy the sermon. What a time. What a time to be living. And I wonder to myself if Paul the Apostle felt that at the time that he was living, at the time that he was serving God, if he felt, what a time, what an incredible time in the sovereignty of God in history that Paul would be called at the time and place where he was. Because Paul was able, through the power of the Holy Spirit, to essentially bring the gospel to the known world in his lifetime. In order for that to happen, Paul had to be born at a time when the roads and the shipping lanes and the written word and the ability to have paper, write on it and get it to other people, and all that was in place. For most of history, we didn't have that kind of communication widespread, but he was born at a time so that he was able to do that right at the time when Jesus Christ came, Emmanuel, God with us to earth, lived, preached, died, rose again, and then chose Paul as a sort of this apostle to the Gentiles to go out and bring that message to everyone. What a time that it was. Of course, God always knows what he's doing. He always knows what he's doing with his timing. He always knows what he wants to happen when, with who, and how. And that's how it was with Paul. But it wasn't an easy time. With all of the glorious, wonderful things that God did and that Paul got to be a part of, it was not an easy time. Along with kind of what was happening in the world as Christ defeated sin and death and hell and grace was preached to the nations, along with that, there was a lot of trouble that came along. Paul dealt with brutal viciousness from those who rejected Christ. Listen to this. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 22 through 27. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. Now listen to all this. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Doesn't, yeah, I'm not going to go into it. It's rocks. It's not what you think. Um, Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils of the city, in perils of the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. So you can see Paul right now is putting together that advertising campaign for Christianity, right? Hey, check this out. Coldness, pain, hunger, beatings. You want some of that? Come join, right? So that's that's what he's doing. But listen to this, the next verse. Besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. He's going through incredible difficulties. Very few of us can say we've been beaten with rods this many times, this many times in prison, this many times, 40 stress, this one, so and so, so on and so forth. Very few of us can say that, that we've gone through that. He was going through that. And the thing that was on his mind was his concern for the churches, that they might, that, that they, that us, that we might be built up in Christ and be becoming strong, finding grace, finding strength through Jesus Christ. That's what he was worried about, not the people beating him. That was the highest thing for him. Look, we've all been facing some difficult times. There's no getting around that. It's been a difficult season. We are in a special time, and it's a difficult time. We are in a time where you're going to have opportunity to work for the kingdom of God. But in that opportunity, and it is great, great trouble is going to be there too. You've seen it. If what's going on right now is any indication, there's a lot of work that we're going to get to do. It's a lot of work that we're going to get to do. You can't can't really compare one person's experience to another person's experience when it comes to dealing with trouble or dealing with pain. 
It's hard to do. Everybody's different. And pain is kind of pain. When I was at George Fox University, young um, and, you know, thought I knew everything. Thought, I, I thought I was so smart back then. It was amazing. And my dad seemed so, like, he didn't know anything. And then three or four years later, I was like, man, he's learned a lot. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I thought I was pretty smart, but the one thing that I, one of the things that I still have from college that I talked about, my buddy Cass Romano and I would sit and we'd philosophize and think we were so bright. Um, and, but one of the things I actually do think was, still makes sense for me, is something we came up with called the cylinder theory. Okay? It's pretty easy. Here it is. Every person has a cylinder, metaphorically. You don't actually, you probably do have a cylinder somewhere, but metaphorically you have a cylinder. And this is the container where you put all the trouble, all the difficulties, all the pain, all the things you're going through. So whatever is going, you're, you're stuffing in that cylinder until that cylinder gets to the top and you're just, I can't take any more. I'm burned out, I'm over it, I just can't even, as the youngsters would say. They probably don't even say that anymore. But that's where you are, right? You just can't take any more. The problem is, is that for a lot of people, they're going to fill their cylinder with whatever trouble they have, big or small. For some people, it's losing a job, having their home foreclosed, having their car break down, losing their girlfriend and their dog. Basically, every country song, right? That's what's in the cylinder. Country music is based on the cylinder theory, if you were wondering. So you can connect that now. That's why it's so bad. No, I'm kidding. I know some of you love it. It's fine. <clears throat> anyway. For some th- people, the worst thing that happened to them is that their Xbox stopped working in the middle of their game while they were playing Halo. And it was just like, I was winning. And, and they're going to, boop, all of a sudden that cylinder is full somehow. And they just can't take it anymore. And they can't believe it, whatever. Right? Because you've seen people will react to things that seem to you very small, especially compared to what you're going through, as if their cylinder was full. No matter how large or how small your problems, people tend to fill their cylinders. Some people have as much as they can take because their buddy stood them up and they were going to go watch the game. And some people... It's a family member that's died or it's some serious, difficult thing. And both fill the cylinder. They both fill the cylinder for people. It's not like it's the same level of sadness or frustration. Obviously, it's different. But kind of regardless of what it is, they act and and, and emotionally live as if their cylinder is full. They just can't take it anymore. It's too much. Now, there is... There are several ways to deal with this problem in our own lives. But there's a couple for the Christ follower that can really help you make sure that not only does your cylinder not get full with nonsense, but that it never gets full no matter what. That you never feel like, I can't take it anymore. Two things that I want to talk about today. One is living in the Holy Spirit. The other is living in truth. Living in the Holy Spirit, living in truth. Let's walk through it. Living in the Holy Spirit means that you're not getting your power, your strength to deal with troubles and tribulations, that all that stuff in your cylinder. You're not getting the strength to deal with that from yourself. It's not where it's coming from. If you do, if, if you try to get the strength from yourself, you're going to fill your cylinder up early and often. It's just what's going to happen. If you are like that, if you are constantly struggling... And and hear me, because I love you. Listen, if you are constantly struggling and constantly on the brink of burnout and despair and you just can't handle it anymore and, and you find yourself in this position once a week, once a month, every day, whatever it is for you, like you're just constantly a person who just can't, you just, you can't believe what you're going through and you can't take another thing. Listen carefully. You're not trusting the promises of Jesus Christ. This is what he says. Matthew eleven twenty eight 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who, are la- who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, my burden is light. Jesus doesn't lie. If he says that that's what it's like when you come to him, then that's what it's like when we come to him. So we've got to ask ourselves, what else are we holding on to when we're coming to him? You know what a yoke is? If you've been to Honduras with us ever, 
or seen a picture or been to school, you know, you know what a yoke is. It's the thing on the ox. You know, there's two ox and they're there. One's on this one's neck, one's on this one's neck. You could put a, a, a really strong oxen and a really weak oxen next to each other. And because that thing is, is made out, it's rigid, it's made out of wood, if that strong oxen pulls, he can pull most of the weight for this one. In our case, it's, you can't even compare it. Jesus is God. He has all the strength. We are weak. We have very little. But if you'll hook up, he's saying, listen, why are you trying to pull that yourself? What do you think I'm here to do for you? It's like if you've ever had a little kid and you see them, you know, they're trying to do something. You're like, let me help you. No, I can do it myself. And you're thinking, okay, you know, I just, I just imagine Jesus with, with me sometimes. just like David, David. <laughs> Hello, right here. And I'm just like, I got it. I can do it. You know, until all of a sudden, I can't take it anymore and I'm burned out and whatever. And he's like, okay, did you read the Bible? Because I've told you very clearly what to do here. Look, your husband is a jerk, probably. Your wife is challenging. <laughs> probably true, okay? You know why? Because all of us are. All of us are. All of us have difficulties. Your job is rough. Your boss is a big turd. I get it. I get it. It's true. Certainly for the staff here at the church, their boss is a big turd. I've, they don't know, but I've heard it lots of times. Look, go to Jesus and get rest. Because he told you to, and because his burden is light, and his yoke is easy. Because he's doing the pulling, because it's his strength. Because you can't live in your own. After Paul listed all those things that he dealt with, Right? I did, this all happened to me. He mentions one more, the next chapter. He mentions this thorn in the flesh that he has. So he's dealing with this physical tribulation, this physical infirmity. And he asked the Lord three times, please take it away. It was there to humble him. And he's like, Lord, please take it away. It hurts. And the Lord responded to him, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 through 10. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. It's enough. I don't have to take it away because my grace is sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Paul knows exactly where his strength comes from. And he knows that the weaker he is, the more perfect Christ's strength will be made in him. It's a really good thing that his strength is made perfect in weakness. Because I'll tell you unequivocally, I'm weak. I know it. I don't have the strength. Especially, I mean, all for, for my whole Christian walk, I've had to more and more rely on God and less and less on myself. But by the time I became a teaching pastor, I can't move an inch without the strength of the Lord. I just don't have anything in myself. We're weak. And because of that, we're strong. If we'll rely on Christ and let his strength work through us. The unbeliever is weak and weak. They don't have anything. That's why you see them running around with their hair on fire, not knowing what to do. But that's not us. It ought not to be us. Because Christ has come to me. I'm gentle, lowly in heart. You'll find rest for your souls. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Paul says he takes pleasure in his infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. I, I, look, when's the last time you had a bill come? You're running that. It's towards the end of the month, right? The lean side of the month. The ramen side of the month, right? And here comes this bill from three months ago because you took your kid to get a cavity filled or whatever, and it's like $600, 700 bucks, and you forgot that it was going to come. You got a mortgage payment due in a few days. You got whatever. You don't have $700. You're in need, in distress. When did that happen to you? And you went, mm, pleasure. Oh, yeah, that's the good stuff. It's just not how we react to trouble. And Paul's like, I take pleasure in this, calls on the princess bride, right? That word you're using, pleasure, I do not think it means what you think it means. We don't have pleasure in difficulties. That's crazy. 
And yet Paul says, he does. We fill the cylinder. Paul's taking pleasure. Persecutions, reproaches, distress. Paul's saying, bring it on. Because here's the deal. When it happens, I get to see the strength of Christ in me. Because his strength is made all the more perfect, all the weaker that I am. The more that we recognize our weakness, the more that we recognize his strength. The more that we recognize our weakness, the closer you are to telling yourself the truth. That our strength comes only from him. That's this whole, I'm the vine, you're the branches. See, vine, branch outside of vine, brown, nothing, soon dead, right? In the vine, hey, I got grapes. That's the way it works. When we realize that, we tend to do very well. And you know what? You can't fill the cylinder because everything is shooting back to the vine, to Christ who's saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. Obviously, I know I've got it. Trust me. If we live in the Holy Spirit and trust God, we know his strength will be made perfect in our weakness. How? Because that's who he is, that's who he says he is, and that's what he has always done to Christ's followers for the entire history of the world. Those who he has called out, he will strengthen. I don't know what you're dealing with, personally. Some of you I do. I don't know what you feel about yourself, how confident you are that Christ can use you, but he can, and he will, and he has, and if he can use me, I promise you, I don't care what you've done, if he can use me, a wicked, dead in my sins man, he can use you in his strength. When we're troubled and burdened and persecuted, we know that Jesus is our only hope. See, sometimes what happens is we have good times. There's some money in the bank. That bill comes and you're like, hey, I'm glad I have money to pay it. Choo choo. If that's you, congratulations. Great job. That's not everybody, but some people do, and they go through a good time. And when they go through a good time, it's hard to see that Christ is your only hope. And you start having other hopes, ones that you came up with. But when you're weak, when you're distressed, when you're persecuted, when it's difficult, then you go, that's right. This is a broken, fallen world. Small K kingdom, not of God, but of the devil. I'm living in it as a light, as salt and light to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ who's going to come and finish this thing that he's already won. But there's no hope in this nonsense. It's all in him. The more you're distressed, the more you're persecuted, the more you see Jesus is your only hope. That's all there is to it. And he's going to come through. Now, it may not be in the way that you think is best. If you haven't learned this, you are not God. Or you don't know what's best. He does. It will always be the best way. It might not be your best way. You got to think in the Romans 8.28 mindset. The Romans 8.28. Wait, Romans 8.28. And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. He works it for good, all of it. And if you're always looking for it to be good, that means you believe that Romans 8, 20 is true. If you're not looking for it to be good, instead you're looking for it to be bad, you do not believe this. You gotta be looking for it to be good. Dr. David, one of our elders, is a big Romans 828 guy. He's just, he's just the kind of Christ follower who's always looking for the Romans 828 in a situation. Right? It, where's the good? Where's the good? Where's the good? Because he knows and he trusts that that's gonna be the way it is. In fact, when River Rock Church, which was the predecessor of Acts Church, had some real trouble and tribulation and trial. And they no longer had a teaching pastor. And the elders were looking for a new teaching pastor that God might be bringing. Dr. David had a Romans 8.28 mindset. That is the only possible way that you would talk to a lawyer who was thinking about becoming a teaching pastor. right? Because lawyer-pastor is about like pleasure and infirmity. They don't make a lot of sense. And yet he did. 
And he saw that this time at this place with what had happened here and the difficulty and the way that God had moved. And it's really an incredible story that I was the right person at the right time to join with the body, which has now become Acts Church and Living Word and all the things that we've done together, that that was the right time at the right place and the right thing to happen. He saw it because he was looking for it. I met with him and Scott Roberts and a couple other guys, and almost instantly, there was a, there was a clearness to my mind, and, I, and I'm guessing to his, that this was Romans 8, 28. This was the right way. And it's a good thing he saw that, because I don't think Scott Robertson liked me. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. How could you not like me? Give me a break. Give me a break. But you're looking for it. You're looking for it. Look for the Romans 8, 28 in everything. Don't look for how it's going to get worse. Don't look for all the bad things that can happen. I mean, be a wise person. Don't be like, everything is butterflies. I'm not asking you to do that. That's dumb. It's not true. But go, everything is rough, but all things will work together for good and have an eternal perspective and be looking for it. And that kind of leads us into our next thing in what you're thinking about. The second way to keep your cylinder from filling up with troubles and tribulations is to be a disciple of Jesus Christ who is living in truth. Living in truth. Now, part of living in truth is having perspective. Perspective requires you to get sort of outside yourself, your own thoughts, your own emotions, and look at what's happening around you and with other people and what they're going through and serving and thinking about other people. That's, that forces perspective. In fact, a mark, I think, of someone who's really maturing in Christ is that they grow and grow and grow in their desire for truth, their, their hungry, hunger and, and thirsting for righteousness, for truth, and in that they grow in perspective. You see them just have a bigger and bigger perspective. Like Paul saying, look, I'm taking pleasure in my infirmities. Not because right now it feels good to be being beaten, but because I see that all things work together for good and my strength, his strength is made perfect in weakness. I see all of that because I'm stepping back from and I have some perspective. I have an eternal mindset. I'm already seated in the heavenly places with Christ. That's where we're supposed to be. Perspective. If you're having a bad day, you feel like your cylinder's full. Boy, is it full. I can't take another thing. Take five minutes. Take five seconds and recognize that there's probably millions, maybe billions of people on earth who probably had a worse day than you. In fact, if you really think about it, you've probably had much worse days than this before and somehow you're still alive. A little perspective goes a long way to help us recognize what's really true. Paul describes some bad days, right? Beaten, stoned, imprisoned. This whole day and night in the sea thing, no bueno. I, you know, of all the things, like I'll take a beating before I'll do the day and the night in the sea. See, here's my thing. I don't want to be eaten by a shark. Don't know about you, if that's like on your list, ways I'd like to die comfortably in my sleep, eaten by a shark. I, I don't know if that's for you, but for me, Eaten by a shark is not on the list, okay? My wife, even worse. Like, she doesn't like to go in the ocean. You can talk to her about that. She's a, she doesn't like fish. Um, I would not like that. But he had some bad days. He had some bad days. But he kept things in perspective. His real focus, concern for the churches. If that's our focus, look, if you're so driven... God, what do you want me to do? How can I do it? How can I get there? How can I learn? How can I grow? How can I make much of your name, Jesus Christ? You're going to have that be the forefront of your mind no matter what else you're going through. Everything else good is gravy. Everything else bad is, oh, well, he's got it. It's all about where your mind is. Many of us have been through difficult times. Been through a troublesome time in this area, in this state, in this country. And in the world, in many, many ways, I can start listing them. I don't need to because you all know them. But many of you have also experienced difficulties in your own personal lives or in your families. People in this room who have lost loved ones in the last year for all kinds of reasons, including COVID. We've dealt with a lot. We've dealt with a lot. But two truths should center us. This is important. Christ's church and Christ's followers have been through worse 
and are going through worse than we are all over the world. There are still places in this world where when you say, I believe in Jesus Christ and you're baptized, public profession of your faith, faith in Jesus Christ, that's a death sentence. When you do it, it's a death sentence. And guess who kills you? Your own family. Your own family kills you because you tell them that you want to love them more. Because you tell them that you have more grace in your life and that you want to serve them. But no, because it's Jesus Christ, they'll kill you. That exists, okay? So Christians have been through worse, are going through worse in the 2,000 years of Christian history. That's one. The second thing is that Christ's church and his followers, Christ's followers who put their faith in him, have withstood at all times. 2,000 years of history of the church of Jesus Christ, and at all times we have withstood, and we will stand. You will stand. Nothing that is going on right now is going to knock you down. It's going to fill your cylinder. It's going to wear you out because you have Christ. You have the Holy Spirit. You have truth. These are truths that you've got to think about. Has he abandoned me? Absolutely not. Never. I don't feel his presence right now. I don't care what you feel. He's there. I do care. Don't, please don't send me an email. I care what you feel, okay? No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm not one of those guys. I really do care what you feel. But the truth, the truth is he's with you. He's told you he's with you regardless of what you feel. You're struggling. It's difficult. Tell yourself the truth. It's the only way to get through anxiety and depression and worry, fear. What's the antidote to fear? Truth, because we've been given a spirit of power and of love and a sound mind. Why? Because we have the spirit of truth. We're going to stand until the Lord comes to get us. And when he does, we're going to go and celebrate the wedding supper of the Lamb. You and me, all of us, and we're going to be like, what's up? Can you believe this? And I'm going to be like, yes. That's why I was doing that. What do you mean, do I believe? No, I'm kidding. We're going to be so excited, and I'm already excited because I know what's happening. That gives me the strength to stand. Truth, people. Truth. Truth. Bathe in it. Bathe your mind in it. The Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write to the Philippians. Just the recipe that we need to have some perspective, to live in the Holy Spirit. Listen to this. Philippians 4, 4 through 8. Start out with rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. It's so nice he said it twice. You are supposed to rejoice. When? Always. Oh, you didn't get it the first time? Rejoice. Have joy. Listen, if you're a Christ follower, you have been saved like me. There is nothing greater. I could weep every day, all day long in what Christ has done for me. Rejoice. Yeah, difficult things happen. I've been saved. I have eternal life with Jesus Christ, who is Lord. The king of the universe who made like stars and stuff and trees and things. And I'm like, that is amazing. Also made me and saved me and loves me. If you can't find joy in that, I don't think you understand the gospel. And I want you to because there's so much joy in it. Next, it says, let your gentleness be known to all men. A little grace goes a long way. A little gentleness. I'm not talking about niceness. We've had this conversation about niceness before. Gentleness is something different. Let your gentleness be known to all men. Be that person. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. What are you supposed to be anxious for? Well, um, nothing. In everything... In everything, by prayer and supplication, come before the Lord, your King. Lord willing, we're going to do Psalm 5 next week and finish the Psalms series. And we're going to talk to him about prayer and what it's like to come before the Lord, the King, and have him hear you. 
and to meditate and to, and to just mumble out the things that are in the deepest part of your heart because he knows them. Come to him with thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, I just got that bill. What am I thankful for? You're thankful for everything he's done to give you breath and life from the time that you were born. And you're thankful for everything that he's going to do, including your eternal life in his kingdom. Your bill. He will take care of you. Thanksgiving. Believing that he's going to work it together for good means we can thank him now for it. And what will happen? And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Okay, so let me get this straight. If I refuse to be anxious and I pray, prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, then the peace of God, which I can't even understand, and most of you hopefully have had this experience, where you should be very upset and you feel God's peace. It's incredible. You're telling me I'm going to get that peace, surpasses understanding. You don't get it. I don't get it. None of us get it. We won't get it. It's God's peace. It's going to guard our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Boy, do I need a guard on my heart and my mind sometimes. How do I get it? Right there. Right there. Follow the recipe or the command. Recipe sounds like something you could do or not do. This isn't, this isn't optional. This is a command. Finally, brethren, he says, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, Whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. Is that what we're meditating on? I don't know that that's what we're meditating on. See, here's the thing. Satan has a whole other plan for what he wants you to meditate on. And it's not as, as bad always as you might think, well, he wants me to think about killing people. Not necessarily. If he can keep you distracted, that's good enough. If he can keep you worried, that's good enough. It doesn't have to be these blatant, crazy sins. How about just get you locked in to what the enemies of Christ want? The world wants your attention more than it has ever wanted it. Why? Because your eyes, they're worth dollars. You know that? Your eyes are worth dollars. If they can keep you watching Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, blah, 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 whatever, all these things, Twitter, if they can keep you watching the news all day long, news, news, I got to know what's happening. They've just told me the same thing 32 times, but I got to see it again. If they can keep you doing that, guess what? They get money. You're a product. Why would you let the world dictate to you what you're going to think about? Take some control over your thoughts. Take some control over your thoughts. Take every thought captive, as the scripture tells us. And meditate instead on these things. Noble, just, pure, lovely, things of good report, the virtuous, the praiseworthy. Watched a movie called Hook this week. I don't know if you guys have ever seen Hook. It's a 1991 movie starring Robin Williams where he's Peter Pan. I love it. It's, I, I'm sure it's a terrible movie from the critic's point of view. It's kind of weird. But I like it. I mean, first of all, middle-aged lawyer is the hero. So... Right there, you got me. You got my heartstrings, right? But what he has to do is, he, does, he forgot that he's Peter Pan, so he has to remember that he's Peter Pan, and what he has to do is he's got to figure out how to fly so he can save his children. Very realistic stuff. But in any case, he has to think of a happy thought in order to fly. Can't fly unless he can think of a happy thought. So he's trying to think of a happy thought the whole movie. Finally, he does. His son or something, he's happy thought, and he flies away, right? And that's great. Happy thoughts are great. Hey, you ever hit a home run? You go back to that time, oh man, that was great. Scored a touchdown, got an A on that test. Sunset at the beach and you're just with your husband or wife and it's just so precious. And well, Yeah, the happy thoughts. Those are awesome. Those are great. I'm not, I'm not downplaying it. This stuff is so much deeper and wider and more amazing than happy thoughts. And even Peter Pan knew he needed a happy thought, but a Christ follower knows he needs the deep, serious thoughts, the noble, the just, the pure, the lovely Things of good report, the virtuous, the praiseworthy. You simply cannot meditate on those things and constantly think about what's in your little cylinder. You can't do both. You have to do one or you have to do the other. You have to take captive all the thoughts, all the things the world's trying to push on you, and they go over here, and you instead choose what you're going to do, and you meditate. You live in the spirit, and you meditate on these good things. Or you let this control you, and you're just now going with whatever the world, whatever fears it brings on you, whatever difficulties... Look, the beauty of Jesus Christ, the beauty of life, 
The beauty of music and art, those are deep. You can spend some time meditating on that. The holiness and purity of the Father. Mm. You can spend some time meditating on that. The power of the Holy Spirit. The goodness and grace and mercy of God that he has shown us and given us in his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. It's worth thinking about. There are so many things like this. So many things that are of good report. Good things. Noble, wonderful, virtuous things. This is what separates a Christ follower from the person who's lost. We're not going to be moved while they're all moving, while they're all freaking out over whatever it is. And I'm not saying there aren't difficult things happening. There are. But while they're losing their minds because this happened or that happened or the other thing happened, we're not moved. We pray for it. We help where we can help. We're servants at the end of the day, but we're not going to be moved. We're not going to think God's not in heaven and he's not sovereign anymore. Because we're meditating on the good, on the true. And that's where we need to be as a church. Because if you want to be used in this incredible time, and it is an incredible time, I don't think it's great that all these bad things are going on. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying the fact that all these bad things are going on tells you something about the time that we're in and what Christ wants to do with you and with this church. If you want to be that person, then you have to be solid and unmovable because you live in the truth and in the Holy Spirit, because when you're unmovable, all those who are sliding away and blowing around with the winds of difficulty and tribulation, who are they going to grab onto? You and through you, Christ. You are his representation here. When you go, hey, I feel terrible about that thing that happened. But you know what? Let me tell you why it doesn't move me. Let me tell you why I know that all things are going to work for good for those who love God, for those who are the call according to his purpose. Is that you? And if they say no, say, it needs to be. Let's know Jesus today. This is the opportunity that you have. I think it was similar for Paul. A lot of garbage going on back then. We think it's rough now, and, it's, and you, you sometimes just need a little history. You know, you're talking about guys like Nero and Caligula running around right? People are like upset about the mayor of whatever town. And we're like, yeah, it's not Nero though. And that's what Paul was dealing with. And that's what the people were dealing with, right? And they were, didn't know what to do and were following false gods and, and finding things to try to fill their life. And Paul brings the message of Jesus Christ and the truth of that. And it changes the world so much. It's hard for us to see it because we're in it. But it changed the world so much that most of the things that even unbelievers think are right and wrong, they think because of how dominant the truth of Christianity became at that time and pushed down through the ages. And the Holy Spirit has been restraining ever since. And there's so many now who need to come to know Jesus before the end. And that's our job. Trouble's going to come. It's going to come. Okay. Let's take pleasure in it. Because in our weakness, he's strong. We're strong through him. You need to grow to be the man or the woman God is making you. You need to have the confidence to do that. You can't believe that you can't be used because you're too old or you're too young or you're too, you have too much sin that's been in your life. You struggle with this, you struggle with that. I don't care what, I don't care. You're a drug addict, you're a pervert, you're a criminal, you're a whatever. Okay. Yeah, that's what all of us were. In that weakness, Christ is made strong. There is nothing that you cannot do that he calls you to do. And if you want to be called and you want to go, he's got it for you. And this church, this is a place for people who want to be called. If you want to fill a chair and hear some music and do whatever, I can give you a list of places to go do that. I'm not saying other churches. You guys think I'm like, I'm not. I'm just saying. It's not here. We're moving. And we won't be moved. Answer the call. Live in the spirit. Live in truth. And you will not be moved. His yoke is easy. His burden is light. And we'll have rest for our souls. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your patience, that in many, many years of following you, I've failed in so many of these areas. 
I have let myself be swept away with all kinds of troubles, filling my cylinder with everything from truly difficult things to the Xbox shutting down, whatever it was, Lord. You know how silly some of the things I've said have been and thought and felt. And yet, Lord, I want to to follow you and your commands in giving everything to you because your yoke is easy and your burden is light. I want to follow you in thinking the right way, in rejoicing always, and letting my gentleness, gentleness be known because you're at hand, Lord, because you are Lord, you are King. And I want to follow you and you've told me what to do and you've told me what's true. And I pray that myself and everyone hearing this and your whole church across the world, Lord, that we would stand up and with one voice cry out, Jesus is Lord. Cry out, saving grace is here. That people might come to know you. And that while we stand unmoved, that the world and those who are spiritually dead would reach out to us and that we might give them strength. I know how much you love every person here and every person watching online. Every person will listen to this later. And how much you love me and how much I love all of them. Jesus, give us strength in our weakness. Make your strength perfect in our weakness. I love you, Lord, in your name. Amen. Thanks again for listening. We hope the Lord blessed you through it. We'd like to invite you to join us on one of our Sunday morning services at either 9 a.m. or 11 a.m. Whether you would just like to find out some more info about Axe Church or if you'd like to plug in and take some next steps in your faith, axechurchnw.org is a great place to start. You can also email us at info at axechurchnw.org. There's always more content coming, whether it's on YouTube or on our podcast channel. So be sure to subscribe to both of those to always get the newest content from Axe Church. Until next time, we hope you have a blessed week.